Many people ask if I look down on digital art or, or how I look at traditional media. It's like, it's all, it's whatever tool works to get your message forth. That's what you should focus on. All right, we are back once again on the Pencil Kings podcast where we talk to inspiring artists and hear the stories of how they became who they are and, and what the, the story is behind their work. Uh, I'm your host, Mitch, and today we're, I'm very excited to talk to Donato Gincola, um, who, if you haven't seen his work, uh, he's a fantastic oil painter that's painted a lot of amazing fantasy and science fiction pieces that for properties that you know of, and uh, we'll let um, Donato talk about that. And uh, welcome to the call. How are you doing today, Donato? All right. Thank you, Mitch. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I was just reading on your – actually, you know, to start off, why don't you tell people some of the, the things that you've worked on that you're most proud of or that you enjoyed working on the most, just so that they have an idea of, of how many different properties you've touched and, and how uh, influential your work is. Oh, wow. Oh, boy, what have I done? Uh, well, you know, I guess I could start with my first sale. Uh, which was uh, my passion with Lord of the Rings, with to- J.R.R. Tolkien's writings. So my very first paid job, it wasn't even a job, I, I'd made a drawing of a ring race, and one of my friend's parents was a huge fan of fantasy and science fiction novels, and so she bought it. So that, that was a $5 sale. So that started on my professional career as an artist uh, way back then. Uh, about, I was probably age 13 or 14. But, uh, but I guess to familiarize your audience with what I've done, uh, I've, I've created about 300 book covers over the years. My career spans more than uh, 20 years now. Uh, I've done magic cards, uh, close to 100 different magic, uh, the gathering trading cards. I've appeared in National Geographic. Uh, I've done some postage stamps for the United States Postal Service and also for the United Nations. also did some space stamps for them. And uh, I guess that's where that's mostly where people are familiar with my work. I think is with the community of science fiction and fantasy artwork. And so hopefully that, uh, that gives you a broad enough area. You know, hopefully someone might have seen some of my work in, in one of those areas. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of your work is oil painting. Is that and and sketching? Correct. That is correct. Yeah, I I'm I'm a dinosaur here. I I, I grew up learning how to draw and paint and was right in the middle, right at the beginning of my career was when the digital technologies of uh, Photoshop was being developed. So the majority of my work, uh, actually not the majority, all, nearly all of my work is, uh, is, is painting, oil painting, and traditional media. And but I think that's so cool because it, it you know, in the, in the previous era, then that was the norm. And now this is kind of a standout skill where everybody's talking about Photoshop, using Photoshop, and so I think it's it's really cool that, you know, having not made the transition or just dedicating to that one medium, I think it's really, it makes you stand out today more so than uh, what what everybody else is doing. And it, when, when I saw it at first, I was like, oh, these are Photoshop um, paintings. Where then, and then on your website, you've got process things. So I was looking through those and seeing like, how do you work? And it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> this isn't Photoshop at all. This is like, this is really cool to see the, the actual process and then watching you like, sketch things out and then applying it to the board and then painting over top of it. So I, I really appreciated that on your website. And if you're listening and you're curious about the process behind some of these, I really uh, encourage you to go and check out Donato's website. Well, I but, think what's, what's what great that's happening in the industry is that the Photoshop does give a, a tremendous amount of tools for artists to, to play with, to experiment with. In much the same way, when I was coming up, there were people who would work with pencils, with graphite, with the airbrush, uh, and, and, you know, painting was, was not the end all be all, but it's certainly, you know, traditional media, you had to definitely manipulate the surface a little bit more, uh, get in there, get your hands dirty, uh, in order to create a work of art where now it's a little bit more, you know, the, the tactile quality of the surface is missing when you're working with, with digital media. Definitely. So, 
One of the things I wanted to talk to you about today is your love of travel and your love of museums. I also share this with you that I um, feel really excited to go and um, to visit museums. I, it doesn't necessarily have to be an art museum, but just any kind of museum. I just feel insanely inspired. Uh, and one of my favorites is in New York, where you're located, um, the National History Museum. I believe that's the one with all the animal displays. Uh, oh, I, I don't okay. know. Yeah, the American yeah. Museum of Natural History. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's that's the right name. My bad. Um, but I, when I went there, I was just so inspired by how lifelike everything was, and it, it to me, I couldn't believe how lifelike they were able to make the displays of the animals. And then, of course, they had a lot of amazing artifacts, and uh, I remember also being inspired by armor sets that they had there. But um, this isn't about me. This is about you, and I'm really curious to find out. Um, is this something that you've always done, always been a fan of going to museums, or something that it's developed over time? Because um, you were mentioning to me that it's been a huge inspiration on you and something that you continue to do and make time for. Wow, that's a, you know, you got a lot, of, a, lot of things, a lot of points to touch on here. So I think what, talking about going to museums, it is not only, it's not about, you know, this isn't about me, it's about you as well when I think about, as, as an artist, what I'm creating. Uh, if I, if I wasn't worried so much about my audience or what I, what my audience would feel from my work, I think I would have gone digital a little bit quicker or, or I'd be doing a lot of it. Uh, or, I mean, I'm, I'm still not digital. So I, I, even though I use a tremendous amount of digital technology around my work, the, the core of it is still traditional media. So when I, when you're talking about going to museums and getting excited about seeing these objects and these dioramas and the, this, these, again, these tangible, tactile things, that's the excitement I get as well when I go to a museum, when I go to an art museum or a uh, natural history or a history uh, museum. These artifacts are interesting. They, they fascinate me because they represent the leave-behinds of our presence, uh, other organisms' presence here on Earth. And that is that that almost that statement that, that these art the, the fact that a make, we make artifacts that we can make artifacts is the main driving force of why I have stayed traditional with my media in the creation of my art is that I want something I'm, I feel like I want to leave some kind of presence here after I'm gone uh, that some people you know that my daughters my family uh, collectors, art collectors, my friends, and then in the future generations can have something, even if they not necessarily know even who I was in my life, uh, that there might be something that, that survives past me. I, I guess it's the way people get a gravestone. For most, most people don't create artifacts in their lives except for their gravestone. Uh, and so that's their, you know, their, right. final, their, you know, their final point of departure, their final statement to the world is here is where I reside. Uh, but I don't want, actually, in a way, I don't want a grave. My gravestone, I hope, will be my art. That makes so much sense. And um, I, I think it's it's really profound. And I, I'm surprised that I've not heard anyone talk about this before. Maybe we're just too caught up in, in being busy the, to, to really think about what our legacy <laughs> think about is going to be. A legacy. Well, I, you know, I, I don't talk about this a lot, but back in my early 20s, I had cancer. Uh, and so, in a way, I died for I died back when I was in my early 20s, even before I began my art career. Uh, and so in a way, I, I, be, I, you know, I came to the grips of thinking about, wow, this might be it. You know, I might be dead in six months or a year and everything I've ever done and accomplished is it. This is it. Uh, but it, luckily, uh, I had survived. I had surgery and chemotherapy and was able to come wow. out on the other side of that. And that's, that gave me a second chance. You know, a second run, and I had made in a way I made sure that I wasn't going to blow it. Uh, but uh, but I'm consciously, you know, every day I'm not thinking about it. I'm, it's not something that sits on my mind and overrides all my other decisions. But I do think about what you know what we all leave behind and and the people we touch and the things we do and uh, and the, what what is your legacy when you when you finally depart from here? And it's 
all of a sudden this interview got really heavy, but, uh, but I'm thankful. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, did, I didn't mean to figure Yeah, that's like, okay, people are going to start tuning out here and go, wow, this guy's really depressed. Like, I don't want to listen to a happy artist. Well, here, let's go, no. let's go happy. Let's, you know, let's talk, go back to that museum thing. Is, uh, you know, going back, the, the reason why I love going into museums is, is to get re-energized, is to get excited about those artifacts, about what you can make and what, what beauty there is that, that these people have left behind. And, and many times we don't even know who these artists were, right? You know, you have these unknown artists uh, creating triptychs or you have even like going back into the caves of Lascaux, you have early humans drawing on the cave walls. Yet, and yet there's this beauty, there's this uh, awareness of the, the world and the projection of their feelings and their desires and their experiences. And there it is recorded for us in, in the, these art forms. And that, that gets me so excited about making art that I can, you know, the, about the world around me, about what I experience and sharing that and, and getting that back out into other people's hands and, and, and getting them excited about what they can do as an artist, what they can experience. And even how, even people who aren't artists, just having non-artists enjoy art, you know, getting inspired by what I, what, what they might see in my work or what they see in other people's artwork and how they can better, going to way better their lives, better their experiences through these relationships with these objects. And so could you actually like walk us through a little bit of, um, I don't want to say process because it doesn't sound like there's any set process to it. You go to the museum and then you, you feel energized and inspired, but is there something like, are you sketching while you're there or sometimes maybe you're just appreciating and other times you are studying and sketching. Is there any ways that you approach going to the museum that might be different than how, uh, Somebody, you know, you just walk through and you look at the, the paintings and on to the next one and on to the next one. You average about 30 seconds looking at a painting. And then, you know, after an hour, you're through the museum and then you go about your day. I don't feel like uh, this is the way that you go to a museum. There, there's different reasons why I go. And when I'm, I'm traveling to, to, let's say, if I'm going to the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg or going to the Louvre, I, I definitely have to have, have to approach those visits on a different level because I, I, I typically have limited time to go back and experience the artwork, or I might just have a single day uh, to try to absorb what I can. And I've, I've learned that you, you don't try to see, you know, try to see every single object and absorb it at the same level as impossible. And, and not every object that you know, speaks to you, uh, resonates with what your aesthetics are in that moment, your experiences are in that moment. So, I, what I, the way I tend to tackle a museum is I'll almost scan it, uh, like flip, you know, walk into a room and just quickly glance around and see what hits you in the gut. You know, see, see what images just resonate with you, whether it be the graphic quality, the content of what's going on inside the stories or just a, you know, the scale of the object or it's just the craftsmanship, even if you're not looking at paintings. If you're looking at sculpture or other kinds of artifacts, you know, medieval manuscripts or door carvings, uh, I, I will then let things just hit me emotionally, and then I'll go up and take them in. They, they'll try to understand, like, what is it about this piece that is speaking to me right now? And with that in mind, I'll sometimes whip out my camera, take some pictures of it, uh, jot some notes down in a sketchbook, or just take it in, be in the moment. Uh, you know, art doesn't always have to be so analytical and about understanding the every intent of the artist or what their uh, what their message they're trying to convey, or understanding exactly the craftsmanship uh, and manufacture mm -hmm. of every object. So it's uh, I, and I'm so I mix emotional uh, experiences with very analytical. Uh, like a, 
understanding, wish, wishing to understand how the artists or, or workers, craftsmen made these objects. And, and when you go, do you usually go to the museum alone? Um, the, like this is your personal time and something that you enjoy for yourself, or do you go with friends or, or family? It, it's, yeah, you're, you're, you're hitting all both. Yeah, it's all. It's probably the same way with anyone. It's, it's both. It's uh, many times I do like to go to uh, the, the museums alone because my pace in which I absorb a show and even what what resonates with me are, are, are different, very different than my even my close friends who have very similar likes and dislikes, yet what will hit you at a museum will be sometimes very different things. I, I, I go looking at paintings, you know, these many times, that's the majority of what I absorb, but much of what really sometimes strikes me emotionally is not just paintings, it's, it's uh, a sculpture, it's a, uh, a carving on a doorway, uh, it is uh, maybe the armor, uh, you know, the etching on an armor, a piece of armor, or a small, intricate little boxwood carving, a little devotional object that is just absolutely stunning and marvel, uh, marvelous to look at. So those, you know, as I'm, uh, so, so what what resonates with me and what I want to look at many times doesn't always appeal to my, especially my children or my family. Uh, so. When I'm going with friends, I certainly absorb a museum on a different level. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just the way you, you know, I think almost any event, any way you experience the world, you know, when you're with a community of artists, you're, you're sharing, you, you're, you're see, I'm seeking out to share my experiences with my friends, not to try to isolate myself and, and then come back together. So there certainly are, that's, it's the same way of, uh, could almost look at the way I make art. And sometimes if I'm at an exhibition or a show and I've got many artists around me, I'm not trying to create or do a demonstration that is a kind of very personal and, and, uh, and deep uh, emotionally. So I'll be more playful, I'll be more outgoing in order to connect with my audience that way. Well, that definitely makes sense. And I guess the reason that I wanted to ask that question was for if somebody's listening to kind of give you permission, uh, give you the listener permission to, you know, go and experience some of these things for yourself um, and that it's okay to do these things alone and, and to really make the experience your own and, and to spend time, you know, if you want to spend a half an hour examining one thing or an hour, you know, do it. If you feel like you're getting something from that, I think it's really time well spent. I remember going to the Sistine Chapel and you're, you're really excited to see the, the painting on the ceiling. And then it was the room before that I found most inspiring where they had these paintings of cherubs um, on the roof and they looked very three-dimensional. And I just, I wanted to stay there, but of course the tour group just kept, you know, marching. Uh, yeah, you had, you had to keep moving through. Yeah, that's the, the disadvantage of some some of these large public uh, or very popular arts. Yeah, that, and, then, and that's where, that's why I enjoy being able to find uh, interest in the non uh, or, or the pieces that aren't on the slate of uh, of works that you just have to go and, and, and see. Uh, I actually I recall very distinctly of uh, being in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg where the uh, they had a, a handful of Rembrandts and there was a Rembrandt's painting called The Prodigal Son and they that was on the uh, uh, the kind of the tour guide hit list of, of where everyone was stopping and looking at this painting. So there's always a crowd around it, but right mm -hmm. next to it, just adjacent uh, on the other wall was another painting by Rembrandt, uh, the sacrifice of Isaac. And for me, I thought the sacrifice of Isaac was 10 times better. The beauty, the, the, uh, the, 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 the emotional connection between the, the characters was so much more powerful, and yet no one was even looking at this painting. Uh, and so I, I was thrilled that I could actually go up there and just spend 20 minutes looking at this painting uh, while all the tour groups, for me, was, were missing some of the best of Rembrandt right, right, right next because they were told <laughs> what to look at. You know, it's like, this is a great painting, look at it. And, and that kind of strips away their, you know, your own confidence or your own desires. It's like if people tell you what to look at, then you don't really get to find out what you like to enjoy. Uh, and that's, uh, so the museums are a way for me to explore uh, what I like, even you know, without having, I never get the audio guides, the tour guides. Uh, I like to walk into a museum 
and just see what resonates with me and and my friends or uh, and my family and we just have fun that way enjoy it that way so i i guess let's turn this in and talk a little bit about your work so we've talked about the, the museum experience um and then when you look at your own work as a creator do you have the same feeling that some works they're just they're capturing your voice and capturing what you want more clearly or more powerfully but it's not received that way when people are looking at it or when you see the reactions of people to your work do you ever have that kind of feeling or or, or relationship happening <laughs> yeah many oh you mean uh, when you you feel like you your message is not being conveyed uh yeah that happens actually quite a lot uh, especially more <laughs> more so more so now because i'm undertaking more personal projects i'm i'm putting myself uh, out there a little bit more, my, more of my personal beliefs and, uh, and, and messages that I want to convey through the artwork. Whereas the, in the beginning of my career and even the middle of my career, most of my work were indeed commissions. They were commissions related to commercial products, you know, whether they were magic cards or book cover illustrations or magazine editorials or advertising for board games that they had a message that needed to be worked through my client's content. Uh, and so that allow, allowed me and distanced me a, a bit from the content. But that's less so now because I'm, I'm now in the midst of creating much a larger body of personal work and private commissions where I am attempting to project, project more of my personal voice in the work. And going back to your, I guess, your question is that you know, I, I guess I'm not disappointed if people don't quite get it. Uh, it's not, you know, again, the, the, I, when I look at art, I don't, I don't try to decipher, or I don't almost want to even know the artist's true intent. And so I'm, I'm attempting to just put artwork out there that, for me, conveys a very emotional connection with the characters and their environments. And what specifically my audience takes away I, I'm not so worried about that. Uh, I just want to make a statement. I want to get these ideas out there, and then I can feel happy, and then I can move on to my next idea, my next vision, uh, and that that frees me up. It's almost a bit of uh, therapy in a way. Like each one of these paintings is a way for me to get something off my chest and and out there. And then once you talk about it, then you know, in a way, I visually talk about it, then I can move on to the next issue that I feel like I need to address. That's so fascinating. Would you be comfortable to share one of those things that you're trying to like get off your chest or get off your back and you're letting your letting that come through your artwork as an example? Well, uh, I don't I don't have a specific message in a way. The uh the much of my recent work has been it's fairly sad. People might look at it being kind of sad. Uh I, I paint a lot of dead people. Uh, or, or people in a, a near deathly state. So people, and, and then showing not just the, the kind of the, the dead person or the dead object, but their, the living people's reactions to that, that, that emotional turmoil around the sense of loss. And so the, the, you know, a dead person isn't something, isn't, isn't something that's not about how or the violence of what brought about this death. Uh, or even not even just the violence, just the, the moment of, of the, the the situation that brought about the death, but but how people deal with a sense of loss. Uh, and again, you know, I guess I, you know, I guess you're looking back at you know my cancer and like, okay, maybe I'm all all consumed in and thinking about death, but it's not it's not a negative thing. It's a more of a positive uh, about how you embrace change and and how you deal with a very human emotion uh, of, of loss. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, um, and so that's, that's something that I'm playing out with quite a bit now and doing that through fantasy and science fiction content. 
uh, and I'm putting it out there. And so far, it's, I've had very positive uh, reactions to these these feelings, these 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 paintings. And I, you know, I just listening to that now. I'm thinking about some of the own lo- my own losses, and I can feel my emotions coming up here. And uh, I think it's it's a very strong theme because it's something that we all will experience um, in our life sometime, you know, that, that feeling of loss and, and the fact that you it's in a context or in a genre that also relates to people on another level. I think it's a, a really powerful combination. Well, yeah, that's I, the, uh, that what you're talking about is that, you know, you're, you're, you mentioned about your own personal experiences of loss. That's in a way why I I'm painting about creating paintings around these feelings is that, it is a human condition, right? It's something that we all can share with and commiserate over, but it's not necessarily a joyful moment, right? But it's, it's a reflective moment. And mm-hmm. that's, I, you know, I think in a way, I, as being an artist, uh, being trying to look at ways to make a statement or make, make my career, I, I, I look around, I've, I've looked around myself at all the, art, the, the commercial work that I've done and what I see is is, is actually a, a vacuum. Uh, uh, this this idea of loss is actually not talked about in the fantasy and science fiction world so much. There there's not that many paintings about these moments. And I think that's where I, I found I I felt like I needed to do this. I needed to come out and and make paintings about these issues because no one else really was talking about it. Um, you know, everyone talks about, you know, you can talk about the heroes and the wonder and the excitement of new spaces, but there's also these very human moments that go along with these, these, uh, you know, the worlds that are created. So, uh, going, you know, in a a fun reflective way, when I look back at my, my youth and as I came up enjoying science fiction, you know, what watch, watching the movies of star Wars as, as a great example you know, one of the greatest uh, emotional kind of rock roller coaster rides was seeing the Empire Strikes Back, uh, and that's the you know, for that for me that's a, a great science fiction film and moment because the good guys lose, they get their butts kicked. Uh, you know, that, that's a great you know that's a sense of loss. You know, like wait wait a minute, we're not the heroes. We we weren't so you know it wasn't such a you know an easy you know slam dunk. You know that what. Like, wait a minute, what happened here, right? And so that's that's you know, if you talk to people my age, they remember that. They remember that that experience, and they, and then they'll probably always look at that, going, saying, "Yeah, Empire was the best film out of all those three, because you you know it was real. You felt human. You know, you weren't just this an enormous mythological hero succeeding in every choice and decision that you made, but you felt the humanity of, of Luke, you felt the humanity of Han and, and the losses that they went through. And, and, you know, it's nice to know that even heroes are, are real. Right. And and that's, I think that's a little bit of what I'm trying to communicate in my work is, you know, heroes aren't always about winning uh, and glorious battles and, you know, having emotional, always emotionally being happy, but there's moments when they are, they're very human uh, and, and, and breakable, uh, and they can be broken. Right. Um, I want to ask one last question, sort of on behalf of the audience, and I, I've asked this to uh, quite a few guests, um, and usually it's it's around the theme of style, like how do people come up with your style, but I don't feel like that's appropriate here. But I feel it's more, what the question is, is like the voice or the theme that, that we've just spent the last few minutes talking about. Do you feel this is something that you could have, done earlier in your career or is it something that's just it it had to take you know uh 10 20 years to percolate before it could come through you know for a a myriad of of different reasons um but there's it seems like there's a lot of people that are hung up on like they can't find their voice they can't find their style and the common wisdom is it just happens over time but i think what you're what you've just been talking about is so powerful and because you're so accomplished i'm wondering what your take on that is I uh, I would say that you do not do not seek a voice, just make paintings. Uh, in the early part of my career, my paintings were certainly more glorious. They were more ex- about that excitement and sense of wonder, and that was great. I mean, that, that was I would never I would never change my path. 
Uh, and that's what I wanted to say. That's what I wanted to communicate. And that's what I felt uh, when I was executing those works. Whereas if I, when I look back, if I tried to go out, you know, from the, the, the out of the gate and try to make these emotionally deep and heavy paintings, to be honest, I think they would be false. They, they would, they would not ring true because my aesthetic, my visual language, my, my experiences have changed. And I I'm speaking from my heart right now, just as I spoke from my heart when I was younger and so that would be my advice is to to seek out your passion and and to paint your passions and not to try to think about what is deep or well how you know how to make a serious painting if i if i even though you might enjoy serious painters if it doesn't ring true to what you want to do what 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 you want to communicate in that moment then don't try to force yourself into it uh, and so that's that goes to with style as well. Is that I, I, I even my style, my color palette, that's that's all kind of slowly evolved and changed. Whereas some people assume that once you're an artist, once you're a successful artist, that your style is your style, that's your voice. But no, your voice changes, uh, your your desires change, and and as an artist, I adapt my working methods to better merge with my needs for communicating those ideas that I wish to do now, not based on what I was doing 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, and so that's something that, uh, I, you know, again, I want to stress is I just, you know, seek, be, be malleable, you know, do not be rigid in, in your pathway and, and just make paintings, make, make art, make, make your, bring your visions forth as in as many and as being as bountiful as possible with the quality that you, and the integrity that you wish to communicate to with them. And that's where your voice will come, and that's how your voice will change and evolve. I love it, I, and I, I feel like it's such a powerful message. I feel like you've, you've given this um, talk at least once before uh, about you know working through your heart and just putting in the work, and that things evolve over time. Uh, and if you're listening, it's very powerful, and it's, I think it's just another call for you to you know put down the podcast, grab a pencil, grab a paintbrush, uh, grab your tablet, whatever it is, and, and do something that uh, speaks to you. You don't have to be so so serious and um yeah just keep keep creating and, and great things will happen along the way yeah that's <laughs> and you know there's a of i was just reading about howard pyle of howard pyle's a 19th century painter illustrator and his teaching there's a, a, a book i was reading about how he would teach and he would talk about when you create your idea when you come up initially with your idea is you throw your heart into it and then you chase after it. You chase after that heart. And in a way, what he means is first you start with emotional integrity, emotional intent, and then you chase after the resolution technically. You find what you need to do technically to make and communicate that emotion, whether that's getting your models, your designs, your composition, whatever it is that you, that does not, you know, you start first with emotion uh, rather than uh, some kind of analytical intent. So you know, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm not. I'm, so in a way, that resonates perfectly with the way I feel and the way I teach as well. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's great. Well, this podcast is really interesting because we, I feel like I, I was just on an emotional roller coaster. We started high, <laughs> then we went low, then we came back high, then we got low again, and now that it's the end, I'm smiling again. But I do feel a little bit, even though it's a little bit about half an hour, like a little bit emotionally drained. This is this has been amazing, um, and so I want to say. Uh, thank you so much, Donato. Is there anything else that you want to talk about, um, to say? I'm, I'm just going to say, like, this is your time if you want, because we usually try to, to keep things uh, short and sweet so we're not taking up uh, too much of your day. Um, uh, but- no, you know, I, I, I think we were able to cover a lot of great content. You know, I, I love the fact that way, in a way we never even talked anything about anything technical, like, oh, how you do this and how you do that, what brushes, because it doesn't matter. It does, you know, that's why I, I, like, I, I love seeing digital work. I love, I mean, it's a, I almost 
regret not being becoming a digital artist because so it's that's such an incredible powerful tool is photoshop and their color management your values and what you can do with merging together images is just stunning i mean it just makes me envious of all so many of these other artists but you know i've chosen my path and i've decided this is what i'm good at this is the way i need to communicate and uh and like i mentioned you know, I, 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 I didn't feel right stepping into f to doing digital work because the, my message did not marry as much with the medium. And so that was my choice. And, and so therefore, many people ask if I look down on digital art or, or how I look at traditional media. It's like, it's all, it's whatever tool works to get your message forth. That's what you should focus on. All right, well, we'll have uh, show notes from this um, at pencilkings.com slash Donato Gincola. That'll be D-O-N-A-T-O dash G-I-A-N-C-O-L-A. And you can also check out Donato's website at Donato Art. Uh, so that's D-O-N-A-T-O-A-R-T dot com. And you can see tons of his amazing examples. Uh, I really encourage you to go there. And you, you might even want to grab a print or uh, because... I feel like a lot of people listening like Lord of the Rings. They like Game of Thrones. They like science fiction. Like you're, this is your audience, and so I really encourage you to go in and check out some Donato's work. Uh, is there anywhere else that people should check you out, or um, things that you have coming up? I know you you exhibit and you you go out to Comic Cons and. Um, That's right, uh, San Diego Comic Con. Uh, I I post uh, a, a about twice monthly blog on some, a mud, muddy colors. You just type in muddy colors blog. You'll you'll find it on the uh, internet, and uh, you know I have done the Game of Thrones calendar for George Martin uh, last year, so that's another place to see oh, a nice collection, twelve of my very recent and, uh, and kind of challenging paintings. Uh, but basically, my website and going you know a lot of conventions where I show. Uh, this fall, I'll, I'll be showing at a LuxCon in Pennsylvania, so I'll have a, a large body of original artwork there as well including some of these uh, dead people uh, paintings, these emotionally challenged uh, pieces. And I, I guess just as a last thing, I'll say, since you're kind of all over the place going to all these different live things, I did notice that all, uh, your upcoming events are on your website. So if you ever wanted to um, go and meet Donato and, and have something signed or something, I'm sure you'd be happy to do that. And uh, you can see what your schedule is. And um, so that's, a, that's probably the best place to find out where, where you're going to be with what um, upcoming schedule. That's right, yeah. All right. Thanks again for listening. Uh, thank you, Donato. I really appreciate it, and I I, I really appreciated the emotional roller coaster. It's a, it's, um, I never know where these interviews are gonna go, and I thought <laughs> at the beginning like I, I would be having like re regurgitating the same stories again and again, but it's it's still unique, it's different every single time. And so I'm really thankful for you uh, taking time out to uh, talk to us. Oh, you're, you're welcome, Mitch. It was a pleasure. And I, I hope your audience is able to get something uh, out of this conversation we just had. Thank you again. All right. Thank you so much. Good demands patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.